Welcome to 7 Investing Now, a show that teaches you how to take a long-term view on investing by better understanding what's happening in the market now. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, 7 Investors, and welcome to the Wednesday edition of 7 Invest Now. My name, of course, is Daniel Brooks Klein, and you can tell, maybe you can't, I'm coming to you live from my bathroom at Caesars Palace. Uh, this is the best internet reception in my suite, so we're gonna go with that. I'm being joined today by Max Chatsko. Max, it has been a wild couple of days. We did a Twitter Spaces yesterday. We're gonna continue talking about the stock market today, as opposed to, I wanted to talk baseball trades, uh, but given the market conditions, we are going to talk about the stock market. How are you doing this, uh, I guess it's afternoon in Pittsburgh, it's still morning here in Vegas. I'm good. Speaking of baseball, the highest valued uh, baseball card ever sold. It was that uh, was it that the T206 Honus Wagner of Pittsburgh. Um, it was like six point six million dollars. I feel like there's a connection there. I want to glean some meaning to investing from that, Dan. I don't know. We sold baseball cards when I ran the toy store, and I always felt like I was stealing money because like something that would be worth like twelve hundred dollars one day might be worth like eighty five dollars the next day when that person had a steroid scandal. So it's collectibles is not the stock market. And that's something that actually comes up a lot. Be really, really careful with investing in collectibles. I have family members with an awful lot of beanie babies uh, that they thought were going to be valuable. We are going to talk, uh, will the Delta variant slow the bull market? We had a, a bit of a rough day in the stock market yesterday, but it is important to remember that US stocks hit record highs Monday. I know that's hard to remember. I'm in Vegas, so remember, remembering things is not that easy. Uh, but we went way back to Monday to hit record highs. And then yesterday, all the major indexes dropped about 1%. Max, let's talk about why the news reported that happened, and then we can get into the reality of what maybe actually happened. Yeah, so um, last, uh, what was it, yesterday, a whole 24 hours ago, Dan, the news that came out anyway was that you know retail sales in July dropped 1.1% compared to June. And that was way more than expected. And so everybody got spooked. And then all the headlines said, well, the futures are down early in the morning. So this must be the reason. So um, as we talked about a little bit on Twitter spaces, uh, you've worked in the media for a long time. Uh, you know how you know there's that pressure to get content out and try to form these narratives. And uh, I think we could both maybe say that sometimes journalists fit data uh, to the narrative they want, uh, even if they're conflicting and on opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah, so, so let me jump in here. And by the way, we would like your questions and comments. Uh, so wherever you're watching this, if there is a comment field, if you type it in, uh, you can ask us questions about the markets, questions about stocks. Uh, we're going to talk for a while in this segment. Then we have a taped interview with our friend, The Science of Hitting. Uh, and then we will come back. We'll take more of your questions and comments. So feel free to weigh in wherever you are. But yeah, so you, what happened yesterday is the lead story was that uh, consumer sales, uh, that's retail car and cars basically, had fallen by 1.1%. And there is the supposition that that drop in sales caused the stock market drop. But that's a very big leap to make because falling 1.1% from record highs really doesn't mean that much. And Max, there's also a little bit of a curveball in the data that I know you like to point out. Yeah, so if you include automobile sales, right? So those were there were more sales in June than in July because of the shortage of automobiles. Um, then retail sales only fell 0.4% in July compared to June. Now, there was still a pretty decent drop in things like uh, clothing sales. Uh, I don't know what that might have been caused by. Um, but again, it's like, this wasn't really that big of a deal necessarily. And Sam, we're going to go a little bit out of order. There is a second graphic maybe, um, about, uh, the historical, there we go. So look, it fell compared to June, but look at where we're at. We're still way ahead of pre pandemic levels. Uh, so the fact like, did this actually cause the market to tumble uh, and by tumble, I mean a whole 1% drop. Oh no. Um, maybe not. Now you could also say that maybe the market's a little elevated and doesn't take much to to maybe give it a little nudge and have it have a, a, a 1% down day. Um, but I, I guess I would say I'd be cautious about trying to pinpoint exactly why the market fell uh, to any one story. Yeah, let me talk about being a newspaper editor or, or being in the media. You have to answer questions whether you have the answer or not. So you basically have to say, okay, this consumer data came out 
And oh my God, it's a drop, it's bad. Or the week before, just a few days before, we added 943,000 jobs to the economy. And that sent the stock market in the green, in the positive direction. But here is the reality. If you actually take a step back and look at unemployment, we have dramatically more job openings than we have people to fill those job openings. So the creation of new jobs is just numbers. It doesn't mean anything. And what's the nuance? Are those jobs flipping burgers at fast food places? Or do we need new highly trained physicians uh, or robot techs or whatever it might be? So just those numbers, I mean, look, we're at a 5.4% unemployment rate, but we're probably at pretty close to full available employment. Well, what does that mean? Well, most people who want a job likely have a job. Why do you not want a job? Well, you might have childcare issues because your daycare hasn't reopened. You might have healthcare issues because your, your grandmother has COVID or, or whatever it might be. So the market is affected in the short term by news. And as a newspaper editor, as a website editor, you have to generate that news. So the guy working at CNN or CNBC or, or, or Fox Business or wherever it might be has to go, okay, this data came out, what does that data mean? But it doesn't necessarily mean that. Like uh, my concern on this data, and Max, you could weigh in, is that we're headed back to school and we had forecast, the National Retail Federation had forecast record back to school sales. And when you see drops in things like clothing after a year where kids only wore sweatpants and t-shirt, that does suggest to me that there is a little bit of consumer wariness. And I think that's about sort of we don't know where the current uh you know the current wave of the coronavirus is going to go uh so i've talked too much feel free to jump in here yeah and one thing that stood out to me in the data was what, what you said we're going back to school or we are about to right um so so the fact that uh, apparel sales fell was kind of interesting uh, compared to june anyway right so it would be important to uh remember that it's relative to june but also interesting, I mean, um, in July was the first month that the child tax credit payment started getting mailed out. I don't know exactly, I don't have kids, but it's like $250 to $300 per child per month. Uh, those are going to go out again or already have started going out in August. So, I mean, I would expect that money to maybe be used to back to school things, hopefully. Um, so maybe in the data we get from August, maybe it's a little bit higher than July. But again, we're still, we're still we are still way above pre-pandemic levels, so... Uh, I, I think I'd be careful about drawing too many conclusions in the the month to month volatility. We're also in like we're in the a recovery that has no really historical precedent, so it's hard to really uh, you know draw too many conclusions. I think. So Rahul, we will get to your question a little later on. Uh, Alexino, yes, good afternoon. We appreciate you watching the program. Uh, but that with Max, you shared a tweet, and I think this really pinpoints sort of how people are thinking about the market. And the reality is what happens on a day-to-day -day basis doesn't matter. And Sam, if you want to share that tweet, I'll let Max read along. Yeah, so I had a funny tweet because, and this kind of goes with the narratives that media come up with, right? Um, you know, so if you if you wake up early enough and you read articles like on the Wall Street Journal, you know, and they'll look at futures data, which has been out for, you know, 26 minutes at that point in time. And maybe it's down, you know, the S&P 500 is down 0.5%. And then they try to uh, they try to tie it into the story of the day. So maybe it's unemployment data uh, is is down, you know. And and they say, oh well, stocks are falling based on unemployment data. But then if you check back an hour later, maybe stock futures are up 0.3 percent. And then they keep the same headline. They just flip what it means. So they'll say, oh, stocks shrugged off unemployment data and they're up. And so it's like you can tell it doesn't really mean anything. We kind of fit the data to the nair. So this is a funny tweet. I just said, based on all these other opposite outcomes, stocks are going to rise no matter what. And that was kind of uh, just my funny take on uh, maybe a little bit of how the media works in, in the moment, right? A lot of it is the noise, not the signal. So Max, we talked a lot about sort of the, the short-term news, but is the real fear here that there's going to be another round of lockdowns and restrictions? I know that you know I'm in Las Vegas and I was when I was here in March, you pretty strictly had to wear a mask. You even had to wear one at the pool, uh, except when you were in the pool. Now, you're supposed to wear a mask inside. It's not being particularly well enforced. Um, that being said, you can also see that it's not particularly crowded here. And it's August and it's 108 degrees, so I'm not projecting uh, that this is necessarily a time where Vegas should be crowded. But it is the this week's, call it stock market uh, fear, and the market is down a little bit today as well, at least it was when we started the show. Is it really just this uncertainty? We're like, geez, maybe I'm not so sure that that September trip to uh, Walt Disney World is a great idea. 
uh, or maybe I'm just going to not go to the mall today and, and hold back a little bit just because I'm not entirely sure, especially with people who have kids who are too young to be vaccinated. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, I think the the ferocity of this wave, and it, I I wasn't even you know you hear about the Delta variant, right? And it's kind of in the news a lot. I hadn't even really checked the data uh, compared to like when we started tracking COVID cases. So I checked it the other day. We were talking about this before the show. This current wave is probably going to be the biggest wave we've had in terms of the known cases that we're going to be able to identify. Uh, that's pretty shocking to me. Um, you know, so the Delta variant is you know highly transmissible. Um, it does seem to, uh, uh, result in more severe infections. We're very lucky. This wasn't the first strain that came out before we had half of our population fully vaccinated. Uh, so that is surprising. That does add quite a bit of uncertainty, as you said. And one of the big reasons, you know, that a lot of, uh, half the population isn't vaccinated, you know, we like to kind of talk about the political angle to it, but kids under 12 currently there's, they cannot be vaccinated, right? It's coming soon. Uh, but those kids are going to school. Um, bringing a bunch of children that live around a building into the same building every day and then sending them back home and then doing that five days a week. That's a really good way to uh, uh, light a fire under a pandemic that's still burning. Um, so maybe we might want to rethink that. And as you've said, you were talking about this, you know, you, you, you know, people who mostly with children, uh, are maybe being a little more cautious about their, their summer plans, their fall plans. Um, and maybe that's, more of what we'll see in terms of like uh, uh, any hit to the economy, however small. I don't think we're going to have lockdowns again, but uh, that could probably restrict uh, certain activities, Dan. Yeah. So I mentioned what the conditions are like in Vegas. I will say that, you know, Disney World has reinstated indoor mask wearing. And I think it's possible that if you have young kids, you kind of don't want to spend $5,000 or whatever you're going to spend on a Disney vacation. Uh, come stay at my place. It's cheaper than that. Uh, but you don't want to spend that kind of money to have a vacation that's not 100%. It might be as simple as they haven't brought back character meet and greets. And if you have a child under five, getting your picture taken with Winnie the Pooh is a big part of the experience. So if you can't have that, it might not be worth it to spend that money. So a lot of this is sort of related to what's going on, but some of it might just be experiential where it's like, yeah, I could do this, but why do this now? Like, look, we don't eat out as often as we used to. And that's not because like I'm afraid to go out. Obviously, I'm, I'm away. I've been on a plane. It's just that there's an added layer of hassle with, with mask wearing and other things you need to do that make it just, hey, let's order in and eat at the kitchen table. Max, you're concerned that we're in a stock market bubble. I, I take a different approach. I think there are a lot of stocks that have got ahead of themselves in valuation, but I'm not overly concerned if, say, a, a Teladoc or a Zoom drops by 50% and then takes 10 years to get back to, to where it was, uh, because I think that's maybe a more realistic growth picture for how it should have gotten. What do you mean when you say a bubble? Do you expect like, you know, we're going to see 50% of the market disappear overnight? No, I don't necessarily mean that. So I just read about this for seven investing members, actually. But, um, you know, when we talk about stock market bubbles or real estate bubbles, we often focus on prices. And that makes sense, right? The stock market is about numbers. Uh, so quantitative analysis has a big role to play. But if we look back at the history of stock market bubbles, right, um, we see that some of the defining features are actually tied to human psychology and also the narratives that we tell ourselves about the economy at the time or innovation at the time. And, you know, if you have that historical perspective, you can go down the checklist. Sure, valuations are stretched in a lot of parts of the market, even for the overall market. Um but also, you know, a lot of those human psychology factors are present as well. Um, every, there's, a, there's a surge of new investors coming into the market, which is good. We love that here at 7 Investing. We want everyone to be, you know, investing in their future. Um, but also, there's a lot of people who maybe, you know, get a little greedy. You hear about your idiot neighbor who's making a bunch of money. And you're like, this guy's a bum. I could be doing better than him. And then I'm, I'm going to put my money in the stock market. And then for 12 months or 24 months or however long it goes, you know, it seems easy. Everybody's making money. Woo! Yeah, but history suggests uh, eventually, you know, the bill does come due. Fundamentals do matter. Uh, momentum is not a durable advantage. So, um, you know, if you're interested in these topics, and I think these are, this is some of the things that, you know, economists kind of shrug this off, right? Because they'll, they'll point to this data point and that data point. And what about un unemployment? And this, this time it's different. Don't worry about it. What about innovation? This, that. And we see all the same arguments in other bubbles, right? Whether it's the dot-com bubble or, you know, in the 1980s for Japanese stocks. Um, or going back in history, you know, any other bubble you want to look at. 
Um, but I, I would encourage you to read some of Robert Schiller's books. So he wrote Irrational Exuberance, great book. It's the third edition is the, the most recent. Very good. He explains a lot of these uh, factors. So you know, he talks about in any bubble, there's precipitating factors. So that kind of lays the groundwork, right? And a lot of these kind of plug into human psychology. Uh, and that sets the stage for a bubble to form. And then there's these amplifying mechanisms, right? So um, more people coming in, uh, different narratives in the media, uh, an explosion of, of talking about the financial um, you know, uh, markets within the media at large. And these kind of just inflate and blow up the bubble a little bit. Um, so he talks about all of these and how they tie together. He admits that there's really, it's tough to map these perfectly onto some of those quantitative metrics that we, we like to follow, like price to earnings ratios or price to sales ratios or the Schiller PE ratio, which is named for him. Um, but he does make a pretty good case that, uh, uh, you know, here's this checklist. These are what we tend to, how we define bubbles. Uh, and I think if you go through that checklist right now, you can make a pretty strong case we're in a stock market bubble. He also wrote a book, I think it published in last fall called Narrative Economics. So it talks a little bit more about uh, not just that, uh, you know, the economic state of the time um, sets certain narrative, like creates narratives, also that narratives create certain economic realities. So uh, pretty interesting book as well. So definitely read those. I talked a little yeah, bit it, too long there. <laughs> so, you know, I want to draw some lines between the dot-com bubble, because I think a lot of people look and say, oh my God, we've got high-flying tech stocks and you know, high-flying tech stocks eventually crash because that's what happened during the dot-com bubble. There is a very big difference here. You might argue, I mentioned two before, Zoom and Teladoc, you might argue that their valuations are ridiculous, that they're very high based on PE ratios, that they should come down. That is very different than companies in the late 90s that had no revenue and were worth billions and billions of dollars, that had no clear path to ever being profitable. We didn't foresee the cloud in those days. I was a dot-com pioneer. I worked at a, an early publicly traded company that spent tens of millions of dollars a year and took in tens of hundreds of dollars a year in advertising. Every server we bought, physical server, was decliningly efficient in terms of running our, our website and our games and the things we were doing. So there are some differences and you might say, there is a, a lot of stretched valuations, but I could say pretty clearly that Zoom and Teladoc aren't going to go out of business. And I could tell you in 1999 or 2000, I could look at 99 out of 100 companies and tell you that they were going to go out of business. And I was, I was wrong because it was 100 out of 100 in most cases. Max, feel free to jump in. Yes. So you're right. And I actually push back when people make the, we always compare everything to the dot-com bubble. Um, and I think there's maybe some parts of this market that have uh, very strong parallels to the dot-com bubble, but there's also other bubbles, like maybe uh, in Jap the, the Japanese bubble and, and Japanese tech stocks in the 80s seems a little bit more uh, reminiscent of what's going on now. So uh, those comparisons to any specific bubble uh, usually fall apart pretty quickly because every bubble is a little bit different, but those basic elements are still present, right? You might talk about Zoom and Teladoc being uh, you know, have, having staying power and they're going to be fine in the long run. And I would agree. Um, but those same arguments were made, like you said, in the dot-com bubble, right? For every Amazon.com that emerged um, because of the information superhighway was going to revolutionize the economy. <laughs> there was a hundred pets.coms, right? So um, you do have to be kind of careful. And I see that going on right now, especially in the, mar the parts of the market that I cover, which are drug development and renewable energy and synthetic biology, you know? Um, there's a lot of people saying, well, this time's different, man. Like, look at the pandemic. We came up with a vaccine in a year or less. Uh, this is the golden age of biotech. Synthetic biology is the fourth industrial revolution. And the reality is you're probably right in the long run. But, man, I see a lot of pets.coms out there right now. A lot of companies that have really high valuations and sometimes no clinical data. They're just kind of trading on this narrative or this idea that, you know, this time's different. It's exactly what happened in the dot com bubble for tech stocks. So, you know. Um, yeah, and people love their narrative. If, if you try to talk someone off a narrative, and we saw this recently with cannabis stocks, cannabis is going to be legal everywhere. Yeah. All these companies are going to be valuable. Here's the reality cannabis is a commodity. It's hard to stand out and be different as a cannabis company. So, the vast majority of people that invested on that narrative have lost a ton of money. Well, we're hearing the same narrative with everything from uh, uh, plant-based meat 
Uh, you know, you can make a case for Beyond Meat. You can also make a case that it's a, a commodity that's easy to duplicate. We're seeing it with sports betting, which I absolutely think is going to be a, a commodity. That doesn't mean there won't be winners. There can be differentiated companies. There are a couple of winners in cannabis, but there's going to be a lot of failures because people buy the narrative, oh my God, this segment is going to be huge, and they don't know how to connect that. You know what's huge? Retail is huge. That doesn't mean Sears is doing great. Like, you know, th there's... There are stories to be told here. I want to get to a comment from Rahul, Rahul Gahuti, or Guti, uh, which is going to touch off an area we were going to talk about anyway. So Sam, if you want to share the one along with Delta, yeah, along with Delta, lots of chatter about Fed tapering. Is that a big deal? I was going to ask Max about this and basically say, if sales slow down and we actually have some negative uh, you know, months in terms of you know, some of the consumer retail data, does that actually sort of give the Fed reason to not taper? Uh, so in the negative, is there actually sort of a positive here? Yeah. Well, that's like when when that was the narrative yesterday, right? Uh, consumer sales fell 1.1% from June. The stock market's down. It's like, well, if you take a step back, that's probably great news for the stock market because that means the Fed is going to keep the pumps running for longer, right? It's going to keep trying to uh, stimulate economic activity if we get bad economic data. So right there, that shows that maybe some of those headlines aren't really very well thought out. Um, but yeah, and this is the thing, like, so with, with the stock market valuation stretched and maybe there's just different pockets that are stretched. Um, uh, I think you could say a lot of valuations are kind of priced for perfection. So it doesn't take much. Maybe it's worrisome data about consumer sales, unemployment data, uh, the Delta variant. Maybe it's, um, talk about when is the Fed going to start tapering or start raising interest rates. Um, any of those stories, it doesn't take much of a push maybe for the stock market to kind of even enter just a little mini correction. Maybe it's just has a few months where it's kind of starting to lose a little bit of value. Maybe it just goes sideways for the rest of the year. The stock market, the S&P 500 is up 18% since the beginning of the year. That's kind of a bonkers annual gain. Uh, and it's only what, eight and a half months in. So uh, uh, if, if you have a little historical perspective, I mean, um, you know, you have to appreciate that a 1% drop or a 5% drop or even a 10% drop isn't really that surprising uh, in, in the greater context. It's really important to remember that short-term news is just that. We don't change our thesis because it rained and Disney World had a bad day. Like that doesn't change your thesis on Disney. If a, if a restaurant uh, couldn't get in its most popular dish, you know, couldn't get the shrimp it needs to make its famous shrimp scampi and thereby some people canceled their reservation. Sure, if that happens every day for three months, it's probably going to have a negative trend. If it happens once, you're probably going to shrug it off. Uh, I, I had breakfast yesterday at a, a restaurant owned by uh, Be a Giada, the Food Network uh, personality. I, I'm not going to attempt it. Uh, De Laurentiis, I believe is her last name. Uh, and the service was really bad. If I go back today and the service is also bad, that might make me think, geez, I don't want to have breakfast here. But the reality is there were a couple of trade shows and it's right at the foot of the conference space. And maybe it was just overwhelmed. And maybe that's the first time since the pandemic that they've had a large crowd and they didn't plan for it. They didn't staff for it. I'm not going to write it off because of one bad day and say, OK, close that restaurant. I think it's really important. I'm going to take Mike Fee's question after we finish the next segment, but we're going to close out here, Max, with uh, before we got on the air today, uh, the U.S. federal government said it's going to recommend booster shots uh, for anyone uh, about eight months, so starting about September 20th. So that would put me uh, online to get one probably in early October because I got vaccinated pretty early. And they're doing this based on a few things. Uh, they're, they're showing lower effectiveness uh, of the vaccine in, in older populations. Uh, they did a study of people over 65. And again, fewer hospitalizations, but effectiveness drops. And there's some data out of Israel, which is an almost fully vaccinated population that says this is beneficial. You have a bit of a mea culpa here. Yeah. So I've been pounding my fist on this program, Dan, for months saying we probably won't need boosters. And apparently I was wrong. Uh, now, I was taking the scientific approach, and I failed to recognize that maybe the government would want to try to get ahead of things. So uh, I was wrong. And the government is going to start, or at least recommend, that make boosters available for anyone who's received two doses of either of the mRNA vaccines uh, starting in September. So it's going to be, obviously, the first people to receive the vaccine. So the elderly population, those in nursing homes, frontline workers in certain categories. Uh, and then over by the you know end of this year, um, anyone who basically is eligible to receive a, a, a third dose uh, could receive one if they wanted to. So there's still some debate in the scientific community. I guess that's a moot point now 
about, you know, do we need these yet or maybe at all? Because uh, effectiveness is waning, meaning, yes, we see some breakthrough infections. Um, but for the most part, you know, the vaccines, the first doses of the vaccines are still doing their job. They're still protecting you from severe uh, disease from hospitalization. If you go to the hospital um, and you have been fully vaccinated, it's usually a different part of the hospital than if you're unvaccinated and going there, right? You're not going to the ICU necessarily. Um, so we have some other data in like Iceland, for example, where um, it's also very highly uh, vaccinated population. Um, and even though they're seeing uh, actually, I think a record number of cases right now from the Delta variant, um, and then at any point in the pandemic, hospitalizations are still pretty low. I think only 3% of individuals actually end up in the hospital. Uh, but, you know, from the government's perspective, right, look at it this way. They don't want to sit, wait too long to say, hey, get some boosters and just pump up your immune responses. The winter's coming. We have like people, you know, kids going back to school. Um, maybe there could be, if the Delta variant mutates and becomes something worse, that would be really bad. So rather to be early than too late. Um, I guess I would think though, you know, I can't imagine we're going to need boosters every eight months, um, but uh, we'll see. I mean, I was I was wrong so far. <laughs> so, so, so very anecdotally, because I've read some of the Israel studies, it does appear that vulnerable populations will absolutely benefit from you know the, the person who could get a minor case and it could be a serious health issue. That is who absolutely probably should get it. Again, I am not a doctor or or in any way medically trained. But there, there are some optics here, right? Forgetting the science of it. If we get a booster or boosters are available, that's going to increase consumer confidence, which again, let's forget the medical part of it here. Increased consumer confidence is good for the economy. It's like wearing two raincoats. It doesn't actually keep you, you know, any more dry, but you feel like you're doing something better. Or maybe it does keep you 2% more dry, but that's probably not worth wearing two raincoats. Yeah, that's true. That's that's a very good point. And uh, that's probably really the government's concern, right? How do we get through the next six months? How do we get through the next year? We're all learning for the first time about, you know, this strain, these strains rather of coronavirus and this pandemic, right? We don't have a blueprint to go on. We're kind of learning in real time. Um, so yeah, anything that can boost the co boost confidence of, of, you know, the population, or at least make put people at ease, right? Um, is just certainly a, a good thing in the long run. No word about whether DC has uh, given a green light to the Booster Gold uh, animated movie. He is a very lesser known member of the Justice League who uh, really could be the spokesperson for all of this. I am being silly. Uh, we're going to close out this segment momentarily, uh, but I wanted to take Mike Fee's comment uh, directed at me if you want to grab that one, Sam. Uh, Dan, is park attendance, that's a theme park attendance, still strong at other theme parks in your area? Universal Studios, SeaWorld, etc.? So it's really difficult to tell. Um, SeaWorld reported relatively good numbers, but I don't trust SeaWorld safety during not a pandemic. So mm -hmm. it would absolutely, I wouldn't go there. I've talked a little bit about how I went to Universal Studios uh, and we were both vaccinated, my son and I, but it was relatively early in the vaccination process and they were enforcing nothing. Now, has it felt crowded? Have I seen lines to get in? Yes. But what you don't know is what the capacities are because they're not reporting what their capacity is. And some of the things like the big shows that suck up thousands of people aren't operating. So when those aren't operating, the park can feel crowded because most people are being shunted. Uh, now, I, you know, to, toward the rides, towards the food lines, towards less things. I've been following the wait times every day. I have some apps that do that. And they look busy, but they don't look August busy. August is usually a very, very busy time, but there are some extenuating circumstances about that. Like we, there is some hesitation. There's also, it's a weird time to fly. Forgetting the wearing a mask on a plane, which didn't bother me at all. It made it so I could work and not have to talk to the person sitting next to me was kind of delightful. Um, but there are less flights. I couldn't get to Vegas directly. I'm sure there are still plenty of flights to Orlando, but are there 12 flights a day out of JFK like there normally would be? Probably not. So there's a rental car issue, meaning you pretty much have to stay on property. Well, on property is not a thing at SeaWorld. On property at Universal is more limited than it is at Disney World. So when we look at all this data, remember that it's not that cut and dry. It's not, you know, hey, clearly people are worried they're not going on vacation. It might be, I'm worried, prices are high, the experience isn't as good as I'd want it to be. And won't I have a lot more fun and a lot more bang for my buck six months from now? I know that the cruise lines 
are throwing free cruises at me for 2022. Um, I don't even know how to book something for 2022 because who knows what I'll be doing. But I'm going to, after this, go book my 4th of July trip uh, for 2022 because I'm being offered that. So as we talk about the market and volatility, I'll let you weigh in in a second here. Just remember that a lot of this is noise, that unless we see a major trend in employment or shutdowns or air travel disruptions, that all of this is just the media trying to fill the hole and people interpreting things however they want. It would not shock me if some tiny piece of good employment data came out later this week and we reverse all of the losses we've had so far this week. It would also not shock me if we just have a red week and it's bad and it feels bad and then Monday something good comes out and, and you know things return to normal. That has been the pattern during this pandemic. Max, I'll let you have the last word. Yeah, so for for you know for investors in in those you know in entertainment or like theme parks and, and travel and things, maybe you know it, it's probably about setting the right expectations, right? It's not like every month is necessarily going to be better than the last because it's going to be more of a choppier recovery, right? In terms of like over time, things will get better, but maybe not in this straight linear fashion. Is that accurate? Maybe. Yeah, absolutely. And it's worth noting that the markets are relatively flat today, and there's going to be some some Fed news later today, which again, won't mean much. They're not gonna make any sort of massive uh, announcement here, but you know, absolutely the market's going to react to it. So again, when you invest in Disney, recognize that if people don't go to Disney World, they might watch more movies at home. They might buy you know, video games based on Marvel characters or, or new stuffed animals or whatever it is. So it's not a simple procedure. A lot of people signed up to Disney Plus because they couldn't go on their normal travel or vacation. This is a topic we're going to revisit. I find it funny that we talked as if the market was down all day. And the, the, the Dow's down a little, but it's actually mostly flat today. And it would not shock me if we actually had a positive day. I, I might be wrong. I might be right. It doesn't matter. We're going to get to my interview with the science of hitting. Uh, Alex is a friend of the show. He's someone we've used his graphics before. He's someone we all follow, follow on Twitter. I, I did not know that he's actually personal friends with Matt Cochran. Um, so he's someone that's in our universe and I want to kind of introduce him to our audience, uh, basically, uh, so you can know who he is if he pops up here or you see us interacting with him. We're going to do this with a lot of our sort of fin twit friends and family, uh, over the next few weeks. And just, just, I think this is about an eight minute interview. Before we do that, we are approaching the first of the month. I cannot believe it is, uh, it's almost September 1st. It feels like we lost a year in a blink. I will also note Max that uh, the temperature, the weather doesn't really change where I live. It goes from hot to hotter, but it's always pretty hot. So like no holiday feels right, like nothing feels normal. So so it, it, it's always shocking to me when like, what, it's Halloween? Like how did that happen? But at the first of the month, we will release our new picks. We have seven amazing picks. What are our picks? There are seven highest conviction stocks. Uh, so each one of us, each month sits down uh, and we really go through every stock that's on our radar, and we pick the one we are most excited about. And then we do a big write-up and we shoot a video presentation. That video presentation, the other advisors can ask us questions, can push back, can sometimes give a bear case where we're giving a bull case. So you get both parts of it. How do you become a member? That is you join at seveninvesting.com slash subscribe. And you give us either $49 a month, that is a bargain or, and this is the real bargain, and you should do this, or $399 a year. That gives you two plus months for free. You also get access to our members only call. We're gonna be doing that on Friday. So if you join today, you'll get an email inviting you to that members only call. If we don't get that email, uh, please email us and we'd love to have you. We go from 11 to 1230 on Friday, answering your questions about our picks, uh, sharing our, our, our favorites on the scorecard, really, anything our members want to know. It is a lot of fun and it is part of a, a marathon day because we will be doing seven investing now live at 1230 with as many members of the team who want to participate. Uh, and our producer, Sam Bailey has corrected me. This interview is about 16 minutes long, uh, but it is an interesting interview. It is a lot of fun. Uh, Max and I are going to stick around to hit the finisher at the end. Max, you can go get a cup of coffee, uh, you know, maybe take a quick jog or something outside. But Sam, if you want to hit that interview, it would be appreciated. Welcome back to the program. I'm joined today by Alex, uh, or as you are more likely to know him, the science of hitting. More on that name later. Uh, he's an investor who focuses on finding high quality businesses 
to own for the long term. In his most recent role, uh, Alex worked as an equities research analyst for a registered investment advisor with $1.2 billion in assets under management. I assume there was just a big room full of cash, probably not. <laughs> Uh, in April of 2021, Alex left that world. He started a sub stack and he moved into this whole crazy fintwit investing advice world full time. Alex, science of hitting, whichever you'd like to go by. Welcome to 7investing now. Oh, thanks for having me. That's a very kind introduction. I was not responsible for raising uh, those assets, to be clear. <laughs> I was just helping to invest them. So it's well, yeah, very, very good work by other people. <laughs> you got you to gotta be careful with that. I went to Hofstra University, and for a long time, our most famous alumni uh, was Ray Romano, and then it was Bernie Madoff. So <laughs> you, re you really need to be careful where the money came from. So let's, let's get to the name first. Uh, what's the logic behind the science of hitting? Sure. Well, uh, the reason I have it in the first place is because I, I started writing online when I was in college and I did so to try and build my resume because I was not having any luck on my job search in the finance industry. Um, so at that time, I started writing under my actual name, Alex Morris. But then when I eventually got hired, it was a bit of an issue to keep writing under my own name with my own face on the article. So had to come up with a pseudonym and the science of hitting is a book by ted williams that warren buffett buffett references from time to time and, and the gist of the this section of the book at least is ted williams would draw you know the the strike zone and it would have circles covering every inch of the strike zone you would say when it's in my sweet spot i can bat 400 or 450 i can be the greatest batter in the history of the game but when it's outside my sweet spot i'll bat 200 and i might not even be in the majors anymore. So the idea is to be, you know, patient and to wait for your time to swing. And and Buffett's little addition to it is in investing, there's no called strikes. So you can truly be patient and, and wait for that fat pitch. And that's a great tease because we're going to have Ted Williams's frozen head on the program. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> um, so you did something that I think a lot of us have done. I've done it a few times. You left your cushy, fairly comfortable. There was probably like cold brew on Mondays and and a nice you know, machine that made cappuccinos. You left that job and you went on your own. What was the logic behind it and how scary was it? Because it's been pretty scary the couple of times I've done it. Yeah, I quickly realized paying for your own coffee is a lot more expensive than having somebody <laughs> else pay for it, especially when you drink as much coffee as I do. So, um, you know, the thought process behind it was I'd been writing online, as I said, since I was in college, so 2010 or so. Um, and that was something for me that I'd always found was really good for uh, evolving my thinking and having very clear and concise research, I guess you'd say. And I also found the feedback from readers incredibly helpful. So it's something that as I started doing it, I, I never wanted to get away from. So I, I ensured after I left my first job, went to my second job that, hey, this is basically non-negotiable. I want to keep on writing. And if it's under a pseudonym, that's fine, but I want to keep doing it. So I've been writing for a very long time eventually joined Twitter and, you know, built a network and friends from that. So after, after 10, 10 years in the RIA world, I just realized the RIA world is a lot of financial planning. And that's obviously a very important part of someone's investment advice that they need, but it, it never really struck a core with me in the way that investing does. And I wanted to do something where I could spend all my time and focus on investing and, and hopefully have it make a difference. So I started looking around probably around the end of 2020. I started doing a lot of a lot of work on the back end to make sure I came out with some articles that I thought were well written. Um, I thought about things like pricing. You know, I, I found a platform in Substack that I thought was a good fit for my needs. So I launched it in April of 2021, and you're spot on. It was terrifying. <laughs> I had no I, I had no idea what to expect. I hoped that my network of people that I got to know over time would would give me a nice start out of the gates. But I told myself, hey, I'll, I'll give myself a year to do this and we'll see if I can make it a real thing or not. And, you know, thankfully so far, people have been very generous in signing up and I've had a lot of great feedback from people in terms of the quality of work. So it's it's gone well and I'm, I'm very excited that it, it's going to be a lasting endeavor. Glad to hear that. Uh, you know, we, we did sort of the same thing. Uh, you know, for me, it was in October joining Seven Investing for the rest of the team a year, or not the whole rest of the team, but the founding members of the team a year ago, March, and it is hard leaving steady employment, uh, especially well-paying steady employment. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, look, I, I talk about this a lot. I'm a little bit older than you. I don't think young people, their first job should be a job because you don't know how great it is 
to work your own 60 hours versus somebody else's 60 hours if yeah. you've never done it. Uh, I also think it can be sort of isolating if you've never sort of had that experience. Uh, financial Twitter helps. It's actually like one of the more up massively places on Twitter. Like it is very rare that I find negative comments, which like pretty much anything else you could put out like, you know, boy, I loved Black Widow and you'll spend the rest of the day dealing with like trolling comments. But in the financial <laughs> world, it, it's generally not like that, which is exciting. But let's talk a little bit. So we're buy and hold investors. That's something we're very upfront about. Uh, you know, we talk, hey, we're going to hold this forever. Forever doesn't really mean forever, but it means, you know, three to five year minimum or as long as you still believe in the thesis. You're fairly similar. How do you go about identifying a stock? How does it get on your radar? For me, I, I talk about this a lot. It's it started with, wait, do I use this product? Is that company public? And then it's obviously expanded from there. How do you go about it? I do a lot of that still. Um, you know, I think I've written a lot about retailers lately, and it's a, it's a great business in the sense that you can walk in a store and truly get a feel for the value proposition. You can compare it to other banners or competitors. So I, I still do a ton of that. Um, you know, another nice part of being buy and hold like you guys are and like I am is that a lot of the knowledge is cumulative. So basically everything I've looked at at any point over the past decade is still useful in some way today. They're companies that I would consider owning or I currently own or they're a competitor of a company that I own. So a lot of the knowledge is cumulative. And and as I, as I find new ideas more recently, a lot of times they'll come from either people on Twitter or people in my network that you know, most of the people I had Jason Greenwald on my podcast the other day, and he said, Hey, you know, I came to you with an idea and you kind of shot it down pretty quickly, which I didn't mean to do. <laughs> but I think a lot of people have a sense for the kind of companies that I'm interested in, because we've talked for long enough. So I, you know, it's a pretty good hit rate in terms of, hey, this is something that is worth digging in for you. So, you know, those are kind of the main ways. And, and really, I spend a ton of time on the companies that I own and their competitors and the stuff that's on my watch list. Those 30, 40, 50 companies for me, that takes a lot of time. So. So I'm one of the few people that covers retail. I, it's a pretty unsexy space. It's easy to know the losers, <laughs> uh, hard to pick the winners. And I yeah. argue that there's really only a few winners. There's a lot of like tweeners. Like there's a lot of like Macy's and Kohl's out there where it's like, I don't want to own them, but they might make it. Mm -hmm. um, how do you identify, especially at an earlier stage, uh, the companies that are going to be unique and exciting because there just aren't that many of them as far as I'm concerned. No, it's a great question. I'm, I'm not sure I ever really have, at least in a way that I've done it in my investment portfolio. You know, I think you can, you can dig in on companies like five below, like you have and companies like Ollie's and you can really get a sense for what makes them different, what makes them unique. And you can think about you know, how hard is this to replicate? Another example might be like Dollar General, for example, in my mind, a big part of the strategy that's difficult to replicate because it's just not in other people's muscle memory is their real estate strategy and where they put their stores. It's not, it's not really direct retail competition in a way. So in my mind, it's more sustainable because of how they get their advantage, if that makes sense. So it's very difficult though. I've invested in uh, it's not technically retail, but I invested in Zoe's uh, Mediterranean Grill, which is a restaurant that was smaller and I thought might have legs and the investment didn't work out terribly, but that probably is going to turn out to not be the case. Um, it's hard, but if, if you can find a I, Chipotle I, early on or a, yeah, a I, I think, I think below. I think food is really big. difficult. You know, oh, yeah. you've, got your, you've got your Starbucks, you've got your Chipotle, you could argue, you know, McDonald's, you certainly have Domino's. And I have so many people making cases for you know, might be someday public companies like say Blaze Pizza, uh, you know, or people talking about sweet greens. And it's like, well, there's a big difference between pretending you're healthy like Chipotle and actually trying to get people to buy <laughs> healthy food. And <laughs> the Met, you know, Shake Shack's another one that comes up that like, I make a pretty strong argument back that like, look, it's a cool product, but if it becomes not special, then it's not going to be special and it's not going to have the sales economics. So it can't scale to 3000 units, but that's right. what gets to, but you mentioned Ollie's there. And I wanted to bring them up because one of my questions that I shared with you was uh, how do you keep your focus on long-term investing versus short-term noise? And I bring this up because today Ollie's is down considerably. Why is it down? I Googled this. Apparently their head of supply chain is leaving. Now that's an important uh -huh. position, but it's not their CEO. It's not their COO. It's supply chains, a whole department. So one person couldn't possibly, but the stock was down like 10%. It could be up now, but like when I looked an hour ago, it was down like mm -hmm. 10%. That is short-term no noise. I don't want to say that's meaningless news, 
but it's tiny road bump news. How do you tune stuff like that out? Because we're dealing with a lot of that right now. Like a company reports mm -hmm. the best results ever. And somebody goes, yeah, but they might not be able to do that a year from now. And then the stock's <laughs> down 8%. I, how do you sort of deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis? Because it, it can be challenging. One additional point on your last thing is funny. People say this will be the Chipotle of X or Chipotle of Y. Chipotle tried that strategy with Asian food. They tried it with burgers. They tried it with pizza. And they've since shuttered all of those concepts that they opened. It's very difficult to do, to your point. Um, how do I stay focused on the long term? You know, retail is a particularly difficult one because you usually see a downtrend in comps coincide with margin compression and then obviously multiple multiple compression on top of the earnings compression or at least relative to expectations so retail can be very difficult and it's probably one of the reasons why i haven't at least to this point invested in some of those earlier stage concepts it's funny to think that always is falling on that news i mean they went through something very similar, I think, at the end of 2019, when the former CEO, Mark Butler, passed but, away. But very different there, that the sure, founder sure. CEO, lifeblood of the company. And I understand, look, I think supply chain is the probably top topic uh, we're going to talk about over the next 10 years in terms of logistics and getting everything around the country. It's a really important job, but it's a replaceable job. Like, you're a sure. desirable place to work. Like, I, I don't think all of a sudden you're going to go to an always. You're like, it's empty. Like, like where's all this stuff? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Again, no, in that case, though, I think I think it became clear. And I, some people probably knew it beforehand. It became clear to me as I dug in. He was incredibly important to their merchandising strategy. was obviously is a huge part of that business. So, you know, I think you just, as always, when short-term things happen, you need to have a good understanding why they're happening. You need to have a good understanding, is this also happening to their peers? And you need to have an understanding of if it's correct, if it's correctable or not. And, you know, in retail, sometimes it can be really, really hard to say. I mean, it's hard to say in all businesses, but retail is especially competitive. So it's always a case by case, but it's tough. We'll wrap up with here. You, you, you mentioned that knowledge is cumulative, and I think that's really important because I can't tell you how many people have said, well, are we gonna have another crash like 1999? Well, no, we're not. Because in 1999, we didn't have the cloud and we didn't have advertising. So we had all of these internet companies where, and I worked at one of them, where someone would give us a $50,000 contract to build something for them with their branding on it. And we'd be like 50 grand, great. And it cost us 80 grand to build it uh, because there was no cloud. There was the, the cost of doing everything was much, much higher. Whereas right now you and I, for like 30 bucks could go launch a website and have all sorts of functionality. Um, so you're, you're newer to this than me, but still have been in it for a while. What's something you've seen like that where people are just absolutely, you know, projecting out because of the pandemic or because of what's getting, you know, going on now that they're really just getting wrong. Huh? Well, that's very, and I'm, and I'm, thro and I'm throwing you for a loop here. This was not in our prep doc. So I'll, <laughs> I'll vamp a little bit to give you time to think about it. But, uh, so I know you're, it's a tough you're, question. You're saying things that you think are basically overstated right now that they're probably not sustainable. Yeah, or yeah, or just like, you know, I'll, I'll give another example. People, you know, say, well, you know, maybe we're in a housing bubble. And I'd argue that we actually have pretty significant population shift where sure, we might see some of these crazy like Miami or, you know, Houston, Texas home valuations, you know, come down 20%, but they'll still be like 60% higher than where they were because a lot more people have moved here. Uh, you know, so right. I, I, I think sometimes people look at a situation and if they don't have the historical knowledge, uh, you know, the, the other one I'll, I'll, I'll say is like the death of the office. Like mm -hmm. the office is gonna change, it isn't gonna die. Is there anything like that that you're sort of factoring in to your, your investing, you know, I, I'm smarter than you that we all like to think as we do this? This is more of a stock specific slant, but I, I would think big tech generally, you know, obviously for a long time, there's been discussion of fangs and whether or not they're over. I mean, this goes back, I would think at least five years. And I think what people may miss sometimes because they're so focused on price action, and obviously those stocks have done incredibly well. What they may overlook is digging in and looking at the actual numbers and recognizing something, you know, like a Facebook, which was, I'm sure the valuation was crazy on any traditional metric when it went public. But you look at the business today, it's going to generate like $120 billion in revenues this year. It's grown at an insane clip. And you look at something like a Netflix and you think about what it, what it truly means to have global scale and potentially some advantages that come along with that. I mean, we'll see how it plays out. But I think in some cases, people 
people point to those things and say, well, it's crazy. It's a bubble. And I don't know how much work they've done and actually looked at the results and realized how capital light these businesses are, generally speaking. I mean, there's a lot of places where they invest money because they're trying to get into new markets or they're trying to cement their competitive position. But they've just grown in a way that there probably isn't any historic precedence for what they're doing. Yeah, I fully agree with that. I think those companies may all look different. Uh, we may see spinoffs. We may see you know, some government intervention, and this is not being political. I will argue that, you know, 60 and 70 year old people probably shouldn't be regulating technology. <laughs> I've talked a lot about how there should be like an industry led OSHA like uh, self regulation, which I know sounds impossible, but that's how the construction industry does it. And it's worked mm -hmm. largely well, we're going to do this again. Uh, I am talking to Alex, uh, the science of hitting. How do we follow you on Twitter if we wanted to do that? Uh, my tag, I think it's called is at TSOH underscore investing. And then, yeah, from there, you can get to my sub stack or anything else you want to find. Thank you for doing this. Uh, I would say I didn't write for the internet when I was in college because there wasn't an internet when I was in college. Uh, I, 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 th I think the Motley Fool was on AOL back in those days. So, Well, it might have benefited me in some ways because what people were reading at that time for me was not particularly good. I hope I've improved a little bit over time. I, I, I actually think that's unbelievably important. I'm a past newspaper editor and I don't care if your writing was good when you were in college, as long as you did it. Uh, you just have that, to do that, it. That's a muscle it's a huge part to... of it. But this is an entirely other story. I'm going to throw it back to me. Thank you for doing this. And we are back. Max, thank you for sticking around. Uh, Sam Bailey, we will get right to it. Let's hit our finisher. Which areas are you most likely to invest more money in? 20% uh, said biotech. 55% said emerging technology. 5% said space. Uh, and 19.2% said electric vehicles. Uh, I invest in everything except electric vehicles. Uh, I follow Max's lead uh, on biotech and uh, emerging technology. I, I take a few little bites at it. I, I sort of wait till companies get more mature. Max, we know you invest in biotech. That's kind of what you do. Uh, are there any others on this uh, that you're interested in? Yeah, I guess I would think all of those categories are kind of under the umbrella of emerging technology in some way or, or, or shape or form. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of uh, subscribe to stick to what you know. So I'm mostly invested in, you know, drug developers, renewable energy and uh, synthetic biology. So all of those can be considered uh, emerging technologies or uh, things with, you know, very long time horizons. Is synthetic biology, Max, like growing me a new pancreas? Like, is that the is that what synthetic biology would be? It could be. That's uh, synthetic biology is more of a tool. It's not an industry. A lot of people don't understand it very well. It's more of a way of thinking, right? So it's it's separate from biotech. Uh, but yeah, that would be growing you a new pancreas or any organ is a uh, xenotransplantation. Actually, a real word, Dan. Uh, that would fall under the umbrella of synthetic biology. Well, here in Vegas, there would be a hell of a market for that. I have seen a lot of people, uh, you know, I, I've had a very low key trip. I'm here by myself. I've seen a lot of people who are very, very happy to be out and perhaps are not taking care of themselves as well as they possibly should, which probably could be right on the billboard for Las Vegas. This has been a fun show. Uh, it is never that fun to talk about a down market day, but I, I checked my portfolio while we were in, the, in our little uh, 16 minute interview there. And the vast majority of my portfolio is up today, uh, Disney being notably up. Nothing changed between yesterday and today for, say, Disney and the cruise lines. Like, like, like nothing about the, about the COVID pandemic. Maybe the booster shot thing is a slight shot in the arm to people's confidence when it comes to travel. But if we've already seen people not willing to take the first shot, I'm not so sure everyone is going to sign up for the third shot. Uh, you know, so... That being said, we talked a lot about narrative. If you can maintain a positive narrative, that does tend to drive the stock market, but be really, really careful in looking at whether the stock you own has an actual story, we call it a thesis, behind why you should buy it, or it has a made up one. I can make a really strong argument as to why AMC is gonna be able to pivot its movie theaters into event hubs, and they're gonna be massive successful destinations. I can compellingly make that argument. I'd be wrong. I'd be silly. That is not a thing that's going to happen. Max, I'll give you the last word and then we will tell people. Why don't you tell people how they can reach us? Yeah. So the last word, I actually wanted to say this earlier and I didn't have a chance to fit it in. But, um, you know, if in the late 90s you were talking about the information superhighway and it was going to revolutionize, you know, the economy, you were right. 
the problem is a lot of the companies that actually would be the become the largest information superhighway companies in the world, like the ones right now, weren't founded, weren't publicly traded, hadn't come up with their most impressive products yet. Pretty much true across the board. Uh, so if you say today, yes, we're in the geno like uh, you know, a genomic revolution or the golden age of biotech or synthetic biology is going to be massively important in the next few decades. I think you're 100% correct. The problem is I think the most valuable synthetic biology companies probably haven't been founded yet, right? They're probably not publicly traded yet. Uh, so you're not late. You're not missing out. Don't feel this FOMO of trying to get in early and just own everything. Because uh, like we said earlier, you're probably going to end up owning a lot of pets.coms. Uh, in terms of getting in contact with us, that's at 7investing on Twitter. You can also... Uh, should we tell everyone to email us, Dan? I don't yes, know what we do. Yes. So you can email us at info at seveninvesting.com. That is for questions about your membership, questions about becoming a member. It's not to ask us to research a penny stock your, your barber told you about. And I, and I tease, but we do get a lot of those. Uh, so any questions about our service, any, you know, you, you want to know where I'm going to be next and you want to hook up for a, a cup of coffee or a drink. Absolutely. That is a good way to, to email us. Uh, I just wanted to follow up. So Max, is your last word there? Are you subtly telling me I should sell my Netscape stock? It would be a good time to do so, Dan. <laughs> uh, sadly, that ship has sailed. For Max Chatsko, for Sam Bailey, I am Dan Klein, heading home from Las Vegas. I'll be back in West Palm Beach uh, for the Friday show, and we will see you Friday at, new at 12.30 Eastern. Oh, Friday is the third Friday of the month. We go at 12.30 Eastern. Thank you.